Hello, good evening, everybody. My name is Ana Elena Gonzalez from the Center for Mexican Studies, UNAM, United Kingdom. And today I'm very happy to have with us uh, Dr. Monica Steinbock, who is a very dear friend and colleague from the Faculty of Philosophy and Letters. Uh, and she is going to give a wonderful talk about uh, Rainer Maria Rilke. But I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about Monica herself. She was born in Mexico City with a German family background. She has a BA degree in art history and a master's and doctorate degree in comparative literature from UNAM, uh, where she is currently teaching German literary history. She has also collaborated with other universities and cultural institutions like the Universidad Iberoamericana, the Instituto de Cultura Superior, the National Museum of Anthropology, the Museum of San Ildefonso and others. Her interests are interdisciplinary and she specializes in issues related to religious and poetic phenomena, myths, symbols, and cultural identities. Rainer Maria Rilke is one of her favorite po poets, and I'm very glad that you're going to share that with us. Very well. Thank welcome. you, Anani. Yeah, Monica. Yeah, I'm very happy to be here and I want to thank everybody that made this uh, invitation possible. And I'm really happy to, to be here giving this little conference. So I think we can get started. Okay, well, okay. Today we're going to uh, talk about Rilke's Hydrangeas, an approach to the ineffable. Um, there are two poems by Rilke related to hydrangeas. One is pink hydrangea and the other one is blue hydrangea. And they were published more or less at the same time and they are very special poems. Uh, I can relate to these poems not only on a uh, academic level, but also on a personal level. They were the favorite flowers of my grandmother. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> so I'm thinking of her right now. Oh. We're going to start right now. Okay, uh, I start reading. The new philosophical proposals regarding the relationship between beauty, poetry, and religion generated by the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century in Europe had a very strong impact on how we perceive and bond to language in general. These novel approaches to language were inspired by the Romantics, but they differ from them since the sense of time was altered by the accelerated pace of life typical for the second half of the 19th century. Instead of the solipsistic self cornerstone of romantic, poetic, and religious experiences, avant-garde artists and thinkers prefer a phenomenological approach that could enable them to generate an immanent, mystical atmosphere where poetry, beauty, and religiousness would unite. This is the case of Raina Maria Rilke, uh, one of the most outstanding poets in the 20th century in German literature. He was born in Prague in 1875, and therefore he has been catalogued as Austrian or Czech. But the truth is that Rilke cannot be pinned down to a specific nationality. He is universal and cosmopolitan, and his work show the influence of countless writers belonging to different backgrounds and contexts. He wrote a very good part of his work in French. Stefan Zweig classifies Rilke's work into three different periods of time. The first one is led by the Book of the Hours, the second by New Poems, and the third by the Elegies of Duino and the Sonnets of Orpheus, in which Rilke, initial poetic proposal, reach their summit. The poems that concern us today, Blaue Hortensie and Rosa Hortensie, are part of new poems. They were published in 1907 and 1908 and belong to the experimental poetic interlude that allowed Rilke to develop his later work. Both poems have been classified by critics as Dinggedichte. This is a word introduced in 1926 by the German, Germanist Kurt Oppert 
and he applies it specifically to Rilke's poetical production. By Dingedicht, in English, thing poem, he understands a particular form of lyric and uses Goethe's Auf dem See as a prototype. According to Upper, Dingedicht is a literary gender developed and perfected in Germany throughout the second part of the 19th century. Dingedicht, poems capture and describe objects or living creatures in an impartial and detached way, thus allowing the thing to speak for itself, even though the thing has no voice of its own. It's like magic, but they believed in those things in the early 20th century. Okay, The purpose of this is to reveal the true essence of the object in question. In this case, the famous romantic self is relegated to the background because the poem aims to generate an empathy between the reader and the described item. The item might then show itself in a convincing way throughout its own and possible perspective. This emphasis as to the unattached and objective position towards Rilke's Dingedicht, poems uh, have made sorry, have made scholars and interpreters to be overcautious, and when approaching Rilke's work, they take special care when they formulate statements regarding the romantic lyrical self and when they make allusions to Rilke's personal biography. I would like to remind you that Dingedich classification by Oppert was done after Rilke's death, and Rilke could not possibly have known about it. So he might not have a good time. <laughs> okay. In all poems, Rilke searches for a suitable way of expressing an aesthetic mystical vision by experimenting with different wordings. Therefore, I want to set aside Opper's classification and open a much broader interpretative horizon as not to constrain the speculative and experimental attitude inherent to Rilke's poetic work. Drake's poetry fluctuates between a phenomenological approach, meaning a very strict description of what is apparent, and an affinity with symbolic and spiritual experiences. In the context of the European avant-garde, Drake is valued for his cosmic mystical vision, which associates and dissociates mythical and religious incentives from personal living experience, which often are intimate and very deep feeling. This is the way he stores his very peculiar poetic atmosphere and succeeds in postulating a new aesthetical convention. As an example, we can mention the title of the book in which the two poems we are analyzing today have been published, Neue Gedichte, New Poems. Here the word nu does not refer to an ex nihilo creation as seen by the Romantics. It rather tries to recoil a sacred space by rearranging things and happenings as well as their historical echoes. In order to support this statement, we will address Rilke's word through the language of flowers. Okay of flowers, their allegoric meaning and their symbolism, regardless of whether we can or we cannot prove that Reiki was aware of the conventional classification of flowers and their allegoric and symbolical meanings. The realm of the symbolic embraces the conscious, the subconscious and the unconscious, and it plays a key role in the configuration of every cultural tradition and identity. Therefore, we can presume that Rilke was at least familiar with a deeper meaning of flowers in a wider context. Okay. According to Amy Rondek, symbols are the reminiscence of objects or images that serve as a doorstep towards a spiritual dimension, in which they open to a multiplicity of meanings. Symbols are more than mere facts or circumstances. They are essential seeds that carry an infinite variety of possibilities. 
Ray can take advantage of the possibilities inherent to symbols in order to place his poetry with the dom in, within the domain of a nostalgic imaginary where he transfigures his yearnings and desires into spiritual experiences. This is the case of the poem Blue Hydrangea, or Blaue Hortensia, to which we will come back later. Okay, we can close the page, okay. For a very long time, flowers have been a way to value, transmit, and express feelings of many kinds. They are closely linked to the richness and to spirituality, and in our world they have gained many allegorical meanings according to their history, shape, color, or smell. We even have conformed a specific flower language, which is known as foliography. Floriography is a cryptologic communication through the use and arrangement of flowers. This became most important in England during the Victorian age, when 19th century social conventions obstructed the free expression of feelings and sentiments. Things that could not be said or messages that could not be sent directly had to be encoded in order to bloom. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the most important flower regarding this language was the rose, Rilke's favorite. He wrote a lot of rose poems, including his own epitaph. In German, Rose, o oh reiner Widerspruch, Lust, niemandes Schlaf zu sein unter so viel Liedern. In English, Rose, o oh pure incongruity, desire to be no one's sleep beneath so many eyelids. There is a game with the word Lied, because in German it's also a song. So I put eyelids and then song, yeah. so we can make the association. It's very difficult sometimes like to traduce poetry. I think it's nearly impossible. <laughs> I had a hard time. Then you look for other people having tried it, and it's, it's really hard. Okay. Nowadays, floriography has lost... Can you change that? And we can change the other one. Okay, uh, I just wanted to state that it's not only the rose or the hydrangea, it's all the flowers we know that have these phallographical connotations. Mm -hmm. So I picked out a few of them, like the camellias. Okay, if you uh, give someone a camellia, it means that uh, you, are, you are a deep longing inside your own heart. It's very poetic. Gardenias are a weakness for the mundane pleasures. Okay. <laughs> In, in Mexico, there is a very famous song called Flor de Gardenia, and it's exactly about these mundane weaknesses, okay? And uh, white rose is always purity and innocence, and gannets, which is a, a flower very closely related to the Mexican identity, although it's not the Mexican flower. It comes from Arabia, okay? But uh, since uh, Diego Rivera painted them, it has become like a Mexican emblem. But it means spiritual love, so it has a very nice meaning. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, nowadays floriography has lost its importance and it's difficult for us to establish to what extent this language was known to Rilke. But we can state that even in our day and time, we have a lot of elements that survive and now belong to common knowledge. For example, everybody knows that red roses stand for passionate love so we can deduce that Reiki did know not only the meaning of red roses, but also of other flowers as well, like the meaning of hydrangeas I want to address today. Hydrangeas have a terribly bad reputation. Yeah, okay. Uh, it is believed that women who grow them in their gardens will argue with their spouses, and those who are not married will never find a husband. There is a legend attached to these flowers. It is said that the French king Louis XIV financed an expedition to the New World to look for exotic plants for his garden. Story goes that on board of the ship that set sail for this purpose was an apprentice by the name of Bannet, who was very tiny and weak and therefore mocked by the rest of the crew. When they reached the coast of Brazil, he was captured by natives and rescued later. 
due to his in this incident, they found out that Bernard was in fact a woman who had disguised herself in order to be able to see the world. Back in France, King Louis XIV allowed one of the flower species they had brought back to be named after her, Hortense. And that's why we have Hortensia in Spanish and Hortense and Hortensia in German. So Hadrangier is uh, like a more scientific word for it, and it's used in English. Could this be a hidden hint to Richter's own experience as to his androgynal background? We know that Rilke had a very conflicting relationship with his mother. She could not overcome the death of her firstborn daughter and forced her son to wear dresses until the age of five. Another possible parallel regarding the legend could be the longing to see the world shared by Hortense and Rilke. Regarding Rilke, this longing must be valued as a prerequisite to existence itself. It even precedes the condition of the concept self, like the German Ich, as a defined gender and or identity. Okay. What Reike is attracted to is precisely the indefinition of things and happenings. The beauty he longs for can be found in the subtle differences produced by the passing of time, in the fragility of a moment, in the briefness expressed by a bat of an eye. I can think of a better flower to convey this experience than the hydrangea with its fluctuating colors and countless umbels that flower and fade and ultimately in an, an, in an entirely way keeping their individual identity but yet forming part of one single flower. We can change that. Okay. After returning from his mystical experience in Russia, a trip he took accompanied by Lu Andrea Salome. This lady uh, I like very much. She is very interesting. She was the uh, daughter of a Russian general, and she was very close not only to Rilke, but to Freud and to Nietzsche. So the story goes that she, she was a lover of all three of them, even though she was married. And she is really intriguing. I have like looked into what she wrote, and it's not that like deep uh, going as Rilke or not as concrete as you can see Freud or Nietzsche, but she must have been quite a personality because as you can see, she is also not like the very pretty lady. She must have had a very strong personality. Okay, well, uh, after she was 30 something, and Rilke, I think she was 19 or 20 when they traveled together to Russia, so there was a significant, significant age difference, okay? And uh, it, it marked Rilke's uh, way of perceiving life that was like very important. Okay, after returning from his mythic, mystical experience in Russia, a trip he took accompanied by Lu Andrea Salome, Rilke settled down in Vopsvede, a community founded by artists located in, the nor in northern Germany. Shortly after, he, ma she married, he married the sculptor Clara Westhoff and had a daughter called Ruth. We can, okay, we can go on. This is, this is like uh, Warpswede. This community is really interesting. It was founded at the end of the 19th century. And uh, then it, it became like very important thanks to uh, a person that sponsored this. And he had a chocolate factory, by the way. And it was like a um, like an attempt to be like the Ecole de Barbizon or the Escuela La Ile Libre we have in Mexico. And most of the uh, artists that were there, they uh, painted landscapes or they painted flowers. And then uh, when in Nazi Germany, uh, the artists divided. Some were for Hitler and others were against Hitler. And uh, the ones for Hitler actually kept the place, so uh, it has like a very dark connotation too. And then it was not important after the Second World War, and it became important again in the 1970s. So this is really, really interesting. And even nowadays, it's an artistical community, and many of the artists also from Latin America uh, have been invited. So it's still active today. Okay. Well, then we were in Borbswede, 
a community founded by artists located in the northern part of Germany. Shortly after, he married the sculptor Clara Vestov and had a daughter called Ruth. This fact might show that at that time of his life, he had the need to belong to someone or to some place and to find an emotional shelter in everyday life. This did not last long since his longing to see the world took him to Paris, leaving his wife and his six month daughter behind. So you can change, please. Okay, we can see Bob Sweden. Uh, the house you can see that was constructed by one of the artists with the uh, last name of Vogler. And he had uh, come uh, into a big inheritance. So he made the garden and the house as an artistic project. So it's very, very nice place. Okay. Um, Another thing which is interesting is, can you change it? Uh, there were two ladies actually uh, that were important. One is Clara Westhoff and the other one is, Claude, uh, is the Paula Modersson. And uh, Rilke was in love with Paula Modersson actually. But there was another artist, Otto Modersson, <laughs> and he was first. So when that was gone, he just took the friend and that was it. So I don't think he was very much in love with the lady. So these paintings were made by uh, Paula Moda, so she's quite famous in, in German painting. Okay, so that's uh, Clara Vesto, and that's the daughter who he left behind when she was six, six months old. Okay. Both Hydrangea poems were written in Paris. But they are linked to Hobbes Vede, where Rilke enjoyed the community's garden and developed his love for flowers. Rilke's approach is clearly phenomenological, but later on he will combine it with Cézanne's flower paintings and produce the poems we're going to analyze today. Okay, uh, Cézanne had, uh, 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 how is, uh, uh, Cézanne had a wife she was called Hortense. I don't know if that's a coincidence, but uh, you can see one uh, uh, hydrangea painted by, by Cezanne here and his wife, of course. Uh, Rilke hated fixed meanings, predetermined codes and systems. His main interest was always to free things from their conventional meanings in order for them to regain their own voice and perspective. This he clearly states in the following poem, published just before his arrival at Bob's Wede. I will read it shortly in German and then in English so everybody can understand. Uh, keeping in mind that translations are always a little tricky. <laughs> okay. Ich fürchte mich so vor des Menschen Wort. Ich fürchte mich so vor der Menschen Wort. Sie sprechen alles so deutlich aus. Und dieses heißt Hund und jedes heißt Haus und hier ist Beginn und das Ende ist dort. Mich bangt auch ihr Sinn, ihr Spiel mit dem Spott. Sie wissen alles, was wird und was war. Kein Berg ist ihnen mehr wunderbar. Ihr Garten und Gut grenzt gerade an Gott. Ich will immer warnen und wehren, bleibt fern. Die Dinge singen höre ich so gern. Ihr rührt sie an, sie sind starr und stumm. Ihr bringt mir alle die Dinge um. Okay, and now it's in English. I fear the word of men. I fear the words of men. They pronounce everything so clearly. And this is a dog, and this is right here. It's called a horse. And here's the beginning, and the end is there. I'm afraid of their meaning, their mockery game. They know everything, what was and what will be. No mountain is wondrous no more. Their gardens and goods are adjacent to God. I always want to warm and resist, stay away. I like how things are seen. You touch them, they are stern and silent. You kill me all my things. Okay. Uh, we can change this. Okay. Not only uh, did Rilke observe the very, very closely in Borbs Verdi, but he also paid special attention to the effects of light that, uh, that light has on our uh, perception of color. Analog to impressionist painters, he stressed the relevance of color reverberations in a pictorial but also in a poetical dimension. 
This is an amazing parallel, for example, between various versions of the Cathedral of Rouen by Monet and the natural colorings and uh, variation of hydrangeas. So you can see the same hydrangea color here. And if you change the slide, you can see the blue. And change the next one. And then you have again the cathedrals of Rouen. If you have to change the next one, and then you have the pink hydrangeas. So you can see how uh, things like uh, come together if you analyze light in a poetic way. Okay? Finding a common ground to compare different artistic ways of expression is far from being an easy task, since the rules established by a canvas and a brush differ a lot from those defined by paper and pen. Gotthold Efrain Lessing analyzed this issue extensively in a book called Die Lau He pays special attention to the multiple items used in each art form as well as to their expressive and receptive possibilities. The same subject was picked up later on by intellectuals who tried to analyze a multifaceted relationship between poetry, painting, and sculpture. It is not possible to address this issue for the moment, since I want to concentrate only on the coloristical interaction between painting and poetry. I believe that is crucial for the understanding of the two poems we are going to analyze today. Paintings and colors immediately trigger feelings in us, while poems and words call for a much larger, larger time span to have a similar effect. Tied to a time sequence, words need to name and or sketch out colors in order to call them up. 17th century authors already postulated the idea that color was linked to the senses and perception while drawing is based on logical, rational ability. Descartes postulates color has nothing to do with reality. Perhaps one of the most important accomplishments of avant-garde might be the emancipation of color from the confinement of drawing contours. Impressionists, for example, managed to consolidate color as an independent ontological phenomena, thus contradicting its traditional function as an attribute. Cezanne, whose work was extensively studied by Rilke, avoided the use of contours and devoted himself to work exclusively with sensation, colorant, nuance, ton, plan, et tache. Sensation, colors, shades, tone, pictorial planes, and spots. This forces the spectator to change his way of perceiving things, since he is not able to see the represented object at first glance and has to reconfigure it through the qualitative condition of color. Okay, we have another cathedral horn. Next one. Okay, blue legend here. Go on. Okay, this is the uh, it is the same colors as we have in Greek and with the hydrangeas too. Okay. Mm. Okay, then where were we? Avagard. The force that forces the spectators uh, to change his way of perceiving things since it's not he's not able to see the represented object at first glance and has to reconfigure it through the qualitative conditions of color. Rilke said that while studying the work of Cezanne, he was not interested in the paintings themselves, but in the qualitative twist of color disclosed in paintings of modern art. With this comment, Rilke brings to light that colors manage to acquire an essence of their own and relate to their environment, and they are far from being a simple attribute or an adjective. They transmute and transform themselves. They invoke and evoke not only objects, but also memories and living experiences. The art critic Miri Park believes that color surpass the limits imposed by objects and exist as an abstraction beyond any bonds to the figurative material world. Furthermore, she states that this is the case with the paintings by Cezanne and the poems by Rilke. Blaue Hortensie and Rosa Hortensie address this phenomena and have been therefore cataloged as coloristic poems rather than flower poems. 
I will read poems, keeping this in mind, okay? Blaue Hortensia, same thing, first in German, then in English. Blaue Hortensie. So wie das letzte Grün im Farbenkegel sind die Blätter trocken, stumpf und rau, hinter den Blüten dolden, die ein Blau nicht auf sich tragen, nur von Ferne spiegeln. Sie spiegeln es verweint und ungenau, als wollten sie es wiederum verlieren. Und wie in alten blauen Briefpapieren ist Geld in ihnen und violett und grau. Verwaschen ist, wie an einer Kinderschürze, nicht mehr getragen ist, dem nichts mehr geschieht. Wie fühlt man eines kleines Lebenskürze? Doch plötzlich scheint das Blau sich zu verneuern in einer von den Dolden und man sieht ein grünes Blaues sich vor grünem Frosch. In English, blue hydrogen. Just like the last green in the color pot, so are these leaves withered and wrecked behind the flower rumbles, which reflect a hue of blue only more they do not. Reflections are tear stains and inaccurate, as if they were about to seize. And like old blue note paper sheets, they wear some yellow, gray, and violet. Washed out like on a children's apron, outworn and now no more in use, we contemplate a small life short duration. But suddenly, some new blue seemingly is seen in just one umbrella, and we muse over a new moving blue delighting in the green. Okay. This is like a very good example of how the reader has to reconfigure the object, the hydrangea, through the connection between blue, green, and yellow, gray, and violet. Reike uses these colors as nouns. They play a crucial role in the poem, but yet they need each other for the reader to imagine a hydrangea. Furthermore, they need not only their fellow colors, but they rest on the rest of the poem to work properly, bringing about contrasts and comparisons, connections and distinctions, and creating a true net of textures and metaphors, memories, yearnings, in order to be able to debouch in a moving blue, delighting in the green. The poem is presided by the title Blue Hydrangea. This is the only time Hydrangea is mentioned in the poem. This means that the poem itself alludes to this flower indirectly, destabilizing thereby the hydrangea and its blue, thus allowing them to transfigure into illusions, shadows, metaphors, hence instaurating a mystical atmosphere we call Reiki's mystical universe. Okay? And we're doing the same with the pink hydrangea. Rosa Hortensie goes even further as to the autonomy of color and its contextual implications. The poem was published in the second volume of Neue Gedichte and it was far less popular than Blaue Hortensie. I believe this is so because it has a higher level of abstraction. This is really curious when I try to look for a, a, a translation to English of pink hydrangea, there were like two. And of blue hydrangea, there were like 52. <laughs> okay, that means that uh, it's much more popular. And it's, I think it's also easier to understand. The more abstract you get, the more complicated uh, things get for people that are like very conventional thinking. So that's, I think, why it happened. So I had to like translate this one myself. <laughs> Let's see how it turned out, okay? Rosa Hortensia. Wer nahm das Rosa an? Wer wusste auch, dass sie sich sammelt in diesen Dolden? Wie Dinge unter Gold, die sich entgolden, entröten sie sich sanft wie im Gebrauch. Dass sie für solches Rosa nichts verlangen, bleibt es für sie und lächelt aus der Luft? Sind Engel da, es zärtlich zu empfangen, wenn es vergeht, großmütig wie ein Duft? Oder vielleicht auch geben sie es preis, damit es nie erführe vom Verblühen. Doch unter diesem Rosa hat ein Grün gehorcht, das jetzt verwelkt 
und alles weiß. Pink hydrangea. Who adopted the pink? Who also knew that it gathered in these umbels? Just like golden things whose gold comes off, they gently lose their red that wears away as if in use. And to think that, that and to think that for that pink they charge no fee. Does it remain for them? And smiled out of the air, are angels present to take loving care? When it fades away, magnanimous like a perfume? Or perhaps, would they expose and lay it bare so it would never learn about its fading? But below this pink, there is a listening green now fading that knows it all. Here I want to point out the relevant absence of those figurative elements very present in Blaue Hortensie that allude to daily life, as for example, the apron belonged to a child or the iridescence note paper sheet. The color pink, which is mentioned in the title Rosa Hortensie, retreats from the flower, escaping herewith to a metaphysical sphere. It is clear that this hydrangea is withered and discolored. There is a distance between the object and the color. The very first question makes it evident that the color pink does no longer belong to the flower. They are Nanda's Rosa and who took away the pink. <laughs> okay. In question, since the tint has not disappeared but has slipped away into the realm of imagination. In fact, it seems as if the umbels would function as containers of an ontological quality prone to be embraced by angels, belonging to a parallel and immaterial reality capable of calling into our minds familiar objects, thus giving them a presence without them actually being there. Contrasting with this faded away pink, the poem invokes the color green introduced by the German word doch, translated by me by but. However, doch in German uh, is a term of assertiveness and underlined by the term jetzt, translated as now. This almost overwhelming presence of green regains its traditional symbolic implications, thus instigating this strange sense of an elapsing eternity. Blue hydrangea and pink hydrangea are poems closely linked to the so-called amimetical aesthetics, a term applied to symbolism in French literature that will lead us later to an abstract poetry, in which common figurative objects function as doorways to the ineffable and its deep spiritual experience. Thank you. This is Cezanne. I have not put any uh, of the Cezanne paintings. Uh, they are a little uh, less faded away as the one you see like in Monet or Degas. But you can see like in this lower part, how color uh, in the, is an independent entity and is not attached actually to the object which are represented in the painting. And that's actually a very big step toward uh, abstract paintings. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. If you have questions, I'll be glad to answer them. I think it's a little difficult because metaphysical things are difficult to digest, but someone, I just love to do it, and I think it's important uh, like to see how things develop from a concrete poetry into like this abstract realm we have then with the avant -garde. Thank you very much. Thank you for a wonderful talk, Monica. <laughs> this has been very, very inspiring. And I wonder if any of you have any, any questions. questions? Or... So, uh, and what about the shape? Uh, I know that in this, in this sun, the shape is very important, like uh, the apples. You know, it's very, very like the, the things of the apples uh, and how he paints, the, he paints them. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, is there any relationship between the color the shape and the, and the flowers? Yes. You know, uh, if we take like traditional painting, 
there is this idea of the contour. Yeah, you just paint like the apple and then you just fill it in or do whatever. Okay, and uh, this makes uh, like, like the main issue like the apple, as you say, like the shapes. Okay, and then uh, the color will be like just an adjective, just an attribute. Okay, and if you talk ontological about uh, essence and attributes, essence is a far more important thing because attributes might change like colors might change and that's why color did not have like an ontological uh, dimension until actually the 19th century where uh, adjectives become ontological dimensions not only uh, as to colors but also as, as to other things okay and uh, actually Cezanne is the first one like to notice this Okay, and then uh, you can see the shape. This is, uh, yeah, you can do this if you have like this drawing here and then you can see like the shapes. And this is not like very, uh, like very uh, clear as the other ones, but you can see here that here the color will be fade, it will be reverberating. Yeah. Yeah, and then the shape like of the, of the leaves uh, will not be important as to leaves, but only as to shape. Okay. Yeah. Maybe that. Shall helps. I go to the last? So yeah, you can go to the last. It's exactly the same. Yeah. See. Sure. Okay. Sure. Of course, yeah. There is a tree. Yeah. Everybody can see it. But actually, uh, it's more important, like the contrast of the color of the tree with the blues, than the tree as an object itself. And so essence, like before that, a tree was the essence and the color blue was the attribute. And you can just turn it around and say the attribute is a theory and the essence are the color. So, so, uh, so can we say, and maybe I'm going to, like, very far yeah. with this, but can we say that this is a precursor of Mondrian? Of course. Okay. Of every abst abstract sure. interaction. Right. Yeah. It's exactly where the twists come. And that's what Rilke was so fond about. That's why he was so fond about Cezanne, because he was not so interesting in his paintings, but in the use of color and in giving a color, an essence to color, making it like a noun. <laughs> okay. Thank you for because I, I didn't know these two points in particular. Uh huh. But I I, I like the picture very very much, and I think that by concentrating on these two points, you manage to draw us closer to what Rilke was trying to do with his poetry, which is very, very difficult. Yes. And, and by concentrating it in, in two points, which are not among the best. No, not the most known ones, yeah. Uh, Except for the blue hydrant here, which is pretty known, but the other one is almost known. Oh, that, that is yeah. my, my yeah. that I, they, they, they seem to be Perhaps less, I don't even know how to say it, it's less um, overwhelmingly metaphysical yeah. than the other poems that are the, 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 having said in Orpheus. Orpheus is very difficult. The, very, very the, the elegies of doing are almost unreadable. Yes. Yeah, I hope. <laughs> but by concentrating on these smaller points, yeah. And, and sort of taking the, the, the petals out. Yeah. You 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 help a lot to, to for, for the general reader to, to understand what we really, what we really trying to do with this absolute life struggle to to to, to say. Yeah. To, to have like this life. metaphysical uh, uh, realm he wants like to in store. And that's why I like him so much because it's very difficult to do. Yeah. Because it's an, an, an imminent uh, religiousness. It's yeah. not, yeah. Yes. And it's not so easy to grasp. No, no, no. But I do thank you for the compliment. No, thank you, thank you. <laughs> okay. Can you tell us about the Mexican artists who have visited Volkswagen? Volkswagen? No, I don't no, know one. No, I, I know no. some from Colombia, but I don't remember their names. No. But and I haven't been to work there myself, but I would like to go. Uh -huh. Yeah. So it sounds yeah. like a very, it sounds a very interesting, interesting place. place. Yeah. Uh, 
Well, I don't know. Uh, is there any uh, very, very good translation of Ricky in Spanish? Because I have, I have read one, uh, one, one translation. It's not, it was not a translation itself, but it was like uh, I don't know how they call it, but uh, it was made by by Juan Rulfo. Yeah, that's what they say that he. Yeah, yeah. And he didn't speak German. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> yeah. The miracles happen in Mexico. That's why. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, he he's, his approach is through other languages, and there and it's a recent discovery. This <coughs> translation of of, of uh, Rulfo uh, yeah. from uh, this poem of Rilke, but there are bilingual translations that are quite acceptable. Okay. Yeah. I don't know the names. I have them at home. So if you are interested, just if you want my mail, I can give you the data. Okay. Uh, I was wondering uh, about the, the legendary aspect, the folklore aspect yeah. of, of the flowers. Do you know where it comes from, this bad luck flower? It's a bad luck flower. In, in Mexico, it's very common. Everybody knows yeah, that if you, have, if you have uh, girls at home and you want them to marry, please do not put hydrangeas in your garden. Uh -huh. They will never get married. <laughs> and, this, <laughs> and as it was a favorite flower of my grandmother, I put hydrangeas. I have two daughters. And hydrangeas, they didn't come. They always, something happened and they didn't bloom. And then I, I put fertilizer on them. And then I put, uh, I don't know, pesticides. And then they were gone. And I had to plant and it did. And that well, no wonder. Your girls are having one boyfriend after the other. Pure hydrangeas. <laughs> what are they doing to the flowers? <laughs> and uh, I don't know exactly how it got uh, this this uh, kind of, of uh, bad reputation, but it is very very common because it was not just one person telling me what your girls you should not. Do. I, I have heard it. In Mexico. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Kind of strange how we attach qualities to flowers that do not have anything to do with the qualities we neglect. Like. Right. Yeah. Language of flowers and flower arrangements. You said arrangements. Yeah, that's a whole things. Cool. Yeah. One is the flower in an isolated manner, and another is yeah. the arrangement itself means yeah. something. Yeah. Like if you have like a yellow rose uh, arrangement with just one white rose. It is not a good sign. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it means the person that sent it did not like you or something. Mm -hmm. But it is a whole. It's a whole science actually. But it's no longer used, unfortunately. <laughs> unfortunately, yeah. That happens if you have like restrictions, and and you have to look like a different way out. Then these things happen. And usually, things that uh, need a lot of thinking to get uh, their way. Uh, they become poetic mm -hmm. yeah, because they get like estranged. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wonderful. Any other questions? No? Well, if not, thank you very much again, Monica. It thank was you, Anna. Thank you. And thanks for the invitation.